Victorian era in terms of that, I don't know, stuffed shirt, crisp mustached, well-oiled hair collection of rampant geniuses that characterized the, uh, the European and, and in particular the British landscape. What do you think were the factors that produced such an explosion of brilliance in such a concentrated area for tragically a relatively short period of time. Well, I think you kind of had a you kind of had a, a, a this there's this term that's used by certain futurists called the singularity, and the singularity is this idea that you get this kind of acceleration accelerated returns process. So the example they like to give is you had these. You have these artificial intelligences that can design the next generation, and that's a little bit better than the precursor one, and so on and so forth. And it does so in a kind of recursive fashion. I think we hit a sort of singularity type situation in the Victorian era, because what we had in the Victorian era, and in particular Britain and America, these sort of Anglophone nations, was you have this very high per capita concentration of genius, of scientific genius. And if you just, you just, looked at London in, say, the 1850s or 60s, you had, you, you, you would have had Galton, you would have had Darwin, you would have had Babbage, you would have had Kelvin, you would have had Maxwell, you would have had, I, I could go Isambard Kingdom Brunel, you know, I could, I could reel off a whole list of these, these extremely eminent people, each of whom are associated with, an, with a groundbreaking work or development, which in its own way is as significant as Einstein's theory of relativity. I walk around London, I don't see those people anymore. You don't you don't get those those people. What you have a kind of third or fourth fiddle type minds who 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 have who tend to work in groups and tend to sort of uh, bureaucratize the way they do things and, and they're very good at organizing people and maybe that's often how they generate their rewards um, more so than, than by actually being innovative groundbreaking risk takers. Yeah, just and that's a bunch what, of bureaucratic busybodies in lab coats these days, it seems. Well, exactly. That's absolutely right. And that's certainly been my experience of, of sort of organized science, as I call it. Uh, there's really no room. There's absolute hostility for anyone who is, is in any way tries to be an original thinker. It's just not, it's not tolerated. But, the, but going back to the Victorians, science revolved around these gentlemen, these, these brilliant people who were recognized by their peers as being profoundly brilliant. And as such, they were able to regulate, to a certain degree, the ecology of science. And this led to a science which was far more streamlined in terms of its pipeline through which uh, major discoveries could translate into major applications, for example. And also people back then tended to value knowledge for knowledge's sake. And this was sort of bound up with their sense that you were in a way doing God's work but science was kind of a revelatory act. The ideology behind this was no theology behind this was known as neo-Thomism. So it's just neo-Thomistic, this peculiar and very good mixture of sort of Christian values and scientific inquiry, which led to this, this idea that, that you know, the truth content of an idea is absolutely sacred to tell lies, to deceive was considered the most serious of sins, anyone who engaged in plagiarism or anyone who engaged in scientific fraud or deception was instantly cast out with huge consequences. There was no, you, everyone with society would turn its back on you, essentially. This kept everyone very straight and narrow. It kept everyone very rigorous. And it, it, it critically uh, created a culture of truth orientation. And this process kind of gelled in this amazing way that we've never seen before, maybe, maybe in certain periods. Of, but anyway, I'll let, I'll let your viewers read the book to find out where in history this may have been present. But um, certainly recently in the Victorian era, we haven't had anything like that since. And if you just look at the, the, the numbers, the rates of macro innovation, that is to say, innovations which are conspicuously novel. So these are new I, new breakthrough innovations that historians look back on that and independent historians, they all go, ah, yes, that was a great thing. That was the splitting of the atom. That was the theory of relativity. That was descent through modification, you know, Darwin's theory. That was the laws of electromagnetism in the case of Maxwell, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Independent historians will all agree with each other, even if they don't agree on anything else, will all agree with each other independently of one another that this was a major breakthrough and this individual was a major and significant individual. And to put these numbers into perspective, because I, I have this sort of horror statistic I like to give people, which illustrates how far we've fallen. The 
macro innovation rate, i.e. the number of breakthrough macro innovations per year, per billion of the world's population, was 16. So you had 16 breakthrough ideas or breakthrough innovations per person, per year, rather, um, per billion of the world's population back in 1850. Today it's four. Well, rather, that's the 2005 number. But it's and four. we could easily say that with improvements in communication, our capacity to have this conversation across the pond, uh, it should be far larger. Uh, better education, exactly. more access to higher education, better nutrition than the 1850s, fewer diseases, and mm -hmm. better communications technology, better publishing technology, greater meritocracy in the realm of ideas because we can have these kinds of conversations should be far more. So I think if you were to normalize to that, it would be even worse. Well, we, we do, and it is. Um, it, it, it absolutely is. When you, when, you, you know, when, you, when you look at it in that way and you, you look at the fact that everybody has access to a level of education that was undreamt of in the Victorian era, very few people would have had the, the luxury of being able to go to university, for example. Hardly anyone went to university. There were hardly any universities back then. You had the Golden Triangle. You had Oxford, Cambridge, and London. That was it. Three universities. Universities, sort of one or two others in Scotland and up north, but era. Very few people would have had the, the luxury of being able to go to university, for example. Hardly anyone went to university. There were hardly any universities back then. You had the Golden Triangle, you had Oxford, Cambridge, and London. That was it. Three universities, sort of one or two others in Scotland and up north, but you know, they don't count. Back then they really didn't. They were not intellectual powerhouses. And I say this as a Scots, a Scotsman, by the way. I'm allowed to to to, to, to der you know, derogate my own people. Um, so so basically the the um, so basically you had this uh, you have the situation in which yeah very few people had access to university or tertiary level education. Very few people had access to secondary level of education. The average age at which people dropped out of school or rather left school was pre-puberty. All they had to do was, was uh, this was after the major educational reforms in, in, the, in the, the, uh, the, the sort of uh, mid-19th century. Um, this was, you know, after the child labor laws. The idea was it was the optimal level of education was maybe up to the age of sort of nine for women or something and 12 for men. And that was it. Um, you had to learn to sign your own name on a bit of parchment and read alphabetic letters. And that was it. And if you could do that, maybe if you were very good, you'd, you'd be moved on to basic sums. And if you were extraordinarily gifted in some in some way, then you could sort of be nudged into this extremely narrow stream that would take you through to Oxbridge and the classics, essentially. But very few people, very, very few people, yet these Victorians were beating the tar out of us in terms of their innovative prowess. We have nothing on them. Mm. Well, Absolutely. Let's close on this topic, too. And I, I want to remind people that this book goes through a lot of data through the 20th century, goes back in time about the cycle of civilizations. It's an incredible book, and I'm, I'm really, really pleased to have read it. But let's talk about what happens in the fading emperors, uh, sorry, in the fading, I guess, empires and embers of human brilliance, because as intelligence falls, it becomes more dangerous to be intelligent. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's not just a general decline. You know, if, if people are generally getting shorter, it's not dangerous to be tall, but it's not the same thing to do with intelligence. I mean, I've noticed, uh, I've been doing this uh, philosophy show for 15 years now, and in the beginning, I could go and give speeches, and it was controversial. I didn't get debates and so on, but there was no violence. There was, you know, some upset and so on. But now it's gotten to the point where people who come to see me speak are getting physically attacked. Their buses are getting turned over. I'm being deplatformed. The level of aggression against, you know, reasonable, sourced, empirical arguments is really escalating. And... It's, it becomes a, a vicious cycle in a way, or it becomes almost asymptotic how much harder it is to be a creative public intellectual because 
the mob has been, I think, generally dumbed down and filled full of aggressive hysteria by sophists to the point where, and, and you were talking uh, in your emails to me about uh, intelligence conferences and just how difficult mm -hmm. it is in the current climate. So it's not just a less intelligent society, it's an anti-intellectual society to the point sometimes of outright violence and aggression. And that can manifest in just threats or it can manifest in, in physical violence. And that aspect tends to accelerate the decline far beyond the genetics. Yes, I, uh, I agree. And I, I think that you, you, the sort of subtleties and nuance of social interaction among individuals, such as sort of equality in the variance of conversational turn-taking uh, is, you know, is a good example of this, um, i.e. If, if somebody is on a stage and they have been invited there and they are not doing anything unreasonable, such as inciting violence or promoting sedition or what have you, it's always been a foundation, a foundational value in the West that such individuals have a right to view, uh, to, to air their opinions. And as long as, again, as long as their opinions don't transgress certain, certain obvious lines that everyone at every point in, in, in history have agreed are obvious lines, then that is considered acceptable. Um, however, today those lines have moved, and the lines have now moved into a situation where we now have these confected outrages, such as microaggressions. And if you wound someone through making them feel bad for 10 seconds because you presented them with a hate fact or what have you, they all of a sudden become victims. And as a result of having that victim status, they draw down on a huge amount of social power that is given to them by a society that finds its virtue in victimhood. And the idea is, is if you're saying things that are making people uncomfortable, you are creating victims, you are triggering victims, essentially. And as a consequence of that, your speech becomes violent because it's aggressive, albeit not at the level of initiation of physical force. It's at the level of initiation of microaggressive force. And as a consequence, the line shifts. And now all of a sudden you find you can't say certain things. Well, our and free so, speech becomes yeah. violence to them, and their free speech translates to physical violence against us, and that's not a very equal approach. Exactly. So, so, so ultimately, the deck becomes sort of stacked in their favor, and in such a way that leads to further um, suppression of these, of individuals who, whose views, shall we say, are not, uh, do not resonate with the normative center of gravity. These are people like yourself who have you know, other ideas about how society should be organized and other ideas about how, you know, how people should really comport themselves in the presence of other people. And it seems that those sort of views belong to a bygone era when people were generally more intelligent and, and were generally more sort of tolerant of this kind of uh, disquisition. And often people got excited at the prospect of being genuinely challenged in their thinking. For example, Darwin is a very good example of this. There's been a lot of sort of nonsense written about how Darwin had the church coming after him and all this sort of thing. It's not really true. He didn't. Um, he actually excited a lot of people's sensibilities, so much so that people paid a lot of money to buy his book and to read what he had to say, including a lot of sort of God-fearing people, like Bishop Wilberforce was a very good example, Soapy Sam, he is, as he was known by his colleagues, he was a, he was a debater, and he debated Aldous, um, uh, not Aldous, sorry, uh, Julian Huxley, the, uh, the, you know, the first Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, as he was known in, in contemporary circles. And of course, the argument goes that, oh, Wilberforce was completely beaten by Huxley, and it was this power of science versus religion. No, actually, Wilberforce was genuinely interested in uh, in Darwinism and did not see it as being particularly incompatible with his religious worldview. He just he was just worried about the effect that it might have on the sort of spiritual uniqueness of man, essentially, and that was the locus of his complaint. But he enjoyed it, and so did a lot of other religious people. They were interested, they saw, because again, their views were tied into this idea fundamentally that if you are an honest person, you're a man of honor, and you go out and you 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 uh, you observe certain regularities in nature, or you conduct certain experiments, and you find a particular result, and that's what you find, and that is the way that God intends it. That is an act of revelation, and to say that it's different 
is to blaspheme. This was how strongly held this view was back then in terms of truth. Truth had this sacred level of value. Today, we don't live in that society. We live in a, we live in a relativist world. Truth is relative. It's, it's based on who it serves. It's based on, on, on you know, who it disprivileges ostensibly, based on the opinions of, of certain people. It's, 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 there's no sacred value put in truth. Truth can be bad and it's something can be, that is to be avoided and even, even codified in law. You know, laws are even uh, created in such a way that forbids certain kinds of, 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 of you know, truth telling in instances where, where that might offend the sensibilities of minorities, for example. So, so you, you, you have a situation in which there is no premium put on truth. Truth is merely expedient. And it doesn't even matter if you are a, an intrinsically untruthful person who makes a career out of telling out and out lies, you will succeed if in so doing, you are providing sort of bromides and other emotional emollients to, you know, to soothe the sort of uh, sentiments of this increasingly emotionally incontinent sort of mass of overly coddled and significantly less intelligent individuals that make up the sort of bulk of our of our so-called middle and upper middle classes in the West. And I exclude the working classes from this because they, they seem to have a really strong resistance to this sort oh, of thing. I, uh, I can usually yeah. tell whether somebody's a rational empiricist simply based on asking if they ever worked a physical labor job in their life. Because it's kind of tough to be overly yeah. intellectual when if something goes wrong, you lose an arm. You learn to be very alert and aware of absolute empiricism and, and reality. And so what happened recently with the conference? Okay, well, basically, I was involved in organizing a conference, which we've held once a year since 2014. So we've, we've held it now, we're going to be holding the fifth one this year, but we've, we've held it for uh, four previous years. It's called the London Conference on Intelligence, or LCI. And basically what it was, was a, an opportunity, because there are very, there's only one conference in the world that caters to intelligence researchers, and that's the International Society for Intelligence Research. And it's a great organization. I've been a member for many years in good standing. Um, I, you know, I'm on the editorial board of the society's journal, etc. And they're fantastic, but they're the only one. Whereas if you look at personality psychology, there are literally hundreds of conferences and multiple different societies that cater to inter interests and personality. So we decided to sort of solve this problem by creating another conference, uh, which we called the London Conference after Hans Eysenck's London School of, in of, of Differential Psychology. So it was, we've held it outside of London, um, out of necessity, actually, <laughs> in recent years. Uh, but we call it the London Conference to, to sort of honor that tradition in differential psychology. So what happened was this. We were minding our own business, just having these conferences. And, uh, you know, pr we promoted the conferences were promoted in a sort of fairly limited way. And, and we got we got you know, interested people coming and lots of respectable academics coming and giving talks and things. Um, Adam Perkins was there at one of them, and he, he gave a really good talk on the welfare trait and all this sort of thing. So we got some very nice academics uh, coming and talking, and, and we, we were just sort of carrying along until a chap called Toby Young came to the conference. And this was in 2017. And Toby Young is a journalist who works for The Spectator, and he's right-leaning, right essentially. But he sort of made a bit of a, a blunder because he gave a presentation at this other intelligence conference, ISIR, in which he sort of recounted his experiences being at the London conference. And he said, oh, it was like a cloak and dagger affair and everyone was using pseudonyms and it was secret and, and all this sort of thing. And he was sort of editorializing. I, you know, I didn't blame him for this. He's just being a journalist, right? This is how they are. They tend to editorialize. It's why they're best avoided. I think your, your strategy <laughs> is, is a really good one. Keep away from them. Um, but... He, he editorialized in the course of giving his presentation at ISIR. And this led to, this unfortunately coincided with him being promoted to a position of political authority. He became head of a, of a governmental organization called the Office for Students, the function of which is to protect viewpoint diversity on campuses. So it's an attempt by the government to put <laughs> you mean, back You mean again. all flavors of hard leftism. Right. Got it. That, that's right. Yeah. So you want 
five flavors instead of two. That's right. So, so, so he was put in charge of this. And unfortunately, that, of course, brought him to the attention of very powerful and organized leftist organizations like Momentum, uh, which is you know, this powerful sort of organization boosting Corbyn at the moment in the UK. And they found out that he'd attended this London conference. And they, they, they found out about it through his, the transcript of his speech he gave at ISIR. And they started digging into it. And they, they decided to use it as a bludgeon against him. And he ended up resigning from the Office for Students, um, sort of going into hiding for a few months. Uh, and we then became targets of some very, very significant and sustained negative media coverage, which ended up being very costly in terms of certain people, including some young, you know, early career researchers who have been um, essentially prosecuted almost by their universities for having been involved in, in, this, in, in this conference. And the, the controversy really revolved around two things. One is the allegation that the conference was secret, and it wasn't. It was by invitation only, which is normal for small conferences. It was not secret. You know, people could attend from the public. Indeed, we had people from the public there. You just had to be sort of in the know. You just had to sort of follow the right blogs and things to see where it was being promoted. But the speakers- well, Also, when you're gonna get attacked for having a conference, and then they say, aha, you don't seem to be promoting it very much. It's like, well, that, that's a good reason for that, you lunatics. Well, there's, yes, there's that as well. But we, we didn't go out of our way to conceal it. Right. You know, we, we, didn't, we didn't hide anything. This was the key, the key issue because we were accused of having hidden relevant information from a university that was hosting the conference. And this I dispute quite strongly as we, we did no such thing. Um, the other thing that, that, that happened with the conference was the sort of topics that were discussed became a major uh, a major problem, essentially. And the conference became became known as a eugenics, secret eugenics conference. And it's peculiar because um, of all the talks we had at this conference uh, over the last sort of the, the previous uh, four years, only 2.7% of those talks, that is to say two out of 75 talks in total, dealt with the topic of eugenics. And both of these talks were given by people who who have sort of made public their endorsement of liberal eugenics. So this is the use of genetic engineering and that sort of thing to, you know, enhance human flourishing in sundry of their publications and have never received a negative word. Uh, one of whom was John Glad, who's sadly dead, um, who came and talked about his, his, uh, his book, Eugenics in the 21st Century, which is just an advocacy of the uh, of, of you know the use of genetic engineering to get rid of diseases and boost sort of traits associated with human well-being and flourishing. He just calls it eugenics. I mean, uh, the joke I made at the time was, you'd have gotten more eugenics at a reproductive genetics conference <laughs> than at our conference. And the other thing, of course, that we talked about, which which offended delicate sensibilities, was the issue of race and population differences. What people don't realize is how mainstream talk of this is in intelligence research. And even our most hard-nosed environmentalists, people like Richard Nisbet, accept that there are differences between blacks and whites in terms of levels of general intelligence. What they dispute is the cause. Mm -hmm. They say it's all environmental. The average intelligence research, and we actually have data on this, says it's a mixture of genes and environment. So they're somewhat on the outside. But the, uh, but the reality is this discussion is entirely mainstream about the reality of these differences. The question is the causes and consequences of these differences. And there is a legitimate scope for debate about these things. So, again, if you look at ISIR, if you pick up any prospectus, you will see a number of, a number of talks devoted to things like Spearman's hypothesis and national IQ studies and all these other sort of race and ethnic IQ differences type things. It's just they picked it up in our case because it became, you know, a, a locus of sen sensationalism, essentially. And again, only a minority of talks at the conference dealt with this topic. To be precise, it was 29 out of the 75 talks that dealt with this topic. So 38.7, it was a respectable minority but it was a minority of talks. Most of the talks dealt with issues that had nothing to do with race differences, nothing to do with eugenics. Most of the talks dealt with individual differences or Flynn effect research 
or developmental psychology or work on my work on mutation accumulation and recent patterns of selection for intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. So cognitive aging as well with neuropsychology there with re regular old cognitive psychology was represented there as well. And we had a huge range of opinions as well among the attendees. Some were very hardline environmentalists, some were hardline hereditarians and most like as is typical for the intelligence research community fell somewhere in between. So we ended up being attacked really, really viciously. We had the Daily Mail come after us. We had the Telegraph come after us, the Guardian, Huffington Post, Russia Today, um, all sorts of periodicals sort of piled in on us, piled high and deep, essentially. And I was attacked in the New Statesman. Um, I, I was singled out for criticism. We had this student journalist who I will not name, uh, who, who sort of really kicked off this with a sensational expose of the secret eugenics conference with neo-Nazi links. This is the other thing, neo-Nazi oh, links. Oh, yes. And the moment you talk about eugenics, people immediately go to the Nazis as everyone who talks about it. Trying to reduce illness by studying genes is somehow wanting to what exterminate the homeless. Like I mean, it it literally is uh, the leap across the canyon on a jetpack of speculation that is always utterly unjust, at least as far as I've ever seen. That's right. So so we were we were we were being attacked. We had you know the phone was ringing off the hook with journalists. I had I had hostile journalists coming after me while I was trying to enjoy my. Uh, my, my time at the University of Arizona, um, I, I, we, we were getting hounded, we were getting rude emails, we were getting all sorts of things coming at us, essentially. And some of us really suffered, I mean, more than I did, because I'm independently funded. And the person who independently funds me is not going to withdraw my funding because I'm involved in, in politic research. As a matter of fact, he's more, more likely to give me more funding because of that. Um, so I'm very lucky. But the problem we have is that uh, a lot of these young researchers and also some established, I mean, with one chap, um, actually, I shouldn't name him because I think there might be a lawsuit involved in what's going on, who was fired from a university at which he had been on faculty since 1984, since before I was born. For over 35 years, he'd been on faculty at this university. And he he was fired because of this. And, and get this, he got a job at another university in the area. Within 24 hours, they fired him from that yeah. as a result of a Google search. We had, we had a lot of these people coming after us on, on a website called Rational Wiki. And, and these are really delightful people. They, they are extraordinarily uh, diligent, almost to the point of stalker ishness in terms of the sort of great lengths they go to dig up dirt on their victims and and they 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 have you know most of the, most of the people they go after are sort of people who believe in you know bigfoot and, and spoon bending and things like that they sort of ostensibly position themselves as skeptics and atheists or what have you but they also have a particular dislike of us and each and every one of us has a sort of lovingly maintained um, you know, wonderfully sort of uh, uh, libelous uh, rational wiki page, which of course, due to whatever it is they do to, to jack up the uh, uh, search rankings of these pages, leads to it being in the first first position in poll position whenever you Google my name or Google, you know, Google any other LCI attendee. And they were coming after people. It was a absolutely, absolutely insane. The damage that this caused was really, really, really significant. And it caused a lot of people emotional distress, as you would imagine, in addition to financial distress and other forms of sort of social distress. And actually, we kind of got our got our last word on it when and I sent you this this paper. And actually, I, I, I'd appreciate it very much if you could make this paper perhaps available as a link. In, in the in, in the description that accompanies this video, because uh, I do want people to see this. And this is a peer reviewed article that I organized the publication of a journal intelligence, um, which was co-signed by 14 other attendees at this conference. So these are people who both attended and spoken at the conference. And what we did is we we basically described how difficult it is to communicate intelligence research. And we looked at the reasons why it might be getting more and more difficult over time. And we, we sort of deal with 
each and every one of the allegations made against us in the media as if it were a testable prediction. So they said we were a eugenics conference. We tested that. We audited our own abstracts. We did a scientometric analysis. We tried to work out what was presented. If eugenics was overrepresented, it wasn't. Race differences conference. No, again, as I mentioned earlier, 38.7% of all talks. So, you know, it's a significant but a minority of talks nonetheless. And so on and so forth. We kind of went through this list of claims. We also looked at how mainstream we were, just to give you another example. So uh, we to do that, where you, where you evaluate how mainstream a conference is, is you work out how many of the papers that are presented end up becoming publications in respectable journals. And it turns out we were, uh, we, we were 48%. 48% of the talks went on to be published in some really top-tier journals, including Twins Research and Human Genetics, and, Cortex. And given that some of the speakers wouldn't be pursuing that, uh, that's a very high ratio. Exactly. So not everyone was going to present, not everyone was going to publish. So to get 48% over four or so years was really rather significant. And to give you some idea for how mainstream that makes us, mm. there was a meta-analysis conducted a couple of years ago of how many conference presentations given at biomedical science conferences end up being present, end up turning into peer reviewed papers. And we actually were doing better than them because on average 44.5%. So we are 48%. So we're a little bit doing a little bit better than them. So we took every one of these claims and we just demolished them one by one. And uh, yeah, if you, if you can help get the word out on this through linking in this paper and, and making more people aware of it, that would be really terrific because still we're getting fallout from this you know there's still damage being done uh, i had to recently defend a young researcher at a university i won't name a researcher i won't name a university i, I was actually summoned as a witness uh, he was being investigated by his own faculty and i just encountered this monolithic wall of hostility from his administrators and his career professors absolutely ridiculous um i mean the poor chap he was you know he was absolutely mortified by the whole thing it really really was not a good experience well and of course it is designed to paint a radioactive moat around individuals and the topic and that is terrible i mean there should be nothing yes. in the realm of science or humanity or intelligence or genetics that is beyond scientific examination and it is strange to think that in, a, in an odd way mike We've had just a couple of hundred years of freedom from blasphemy laws. Yes, and they're back with a yeah. vengeance. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, listen, um, I just really, really appreciate your time. Was, I'm, I'm glad that we had a good old chunk of time because it, we could keep going. But let's um, uh, remind people the name of the book, At Our Wits End, Why, we, why We're Becoming Less Intelligent and What It Means for the Future, Societist by Edward Dutton, D-U-T-T-O-N. Michael A. Woodley, W-O-O-D-L-E-Y of Miney, and uh, that's M-E-N-I-E. -E. Uh, I'll put a link to it below, and you can get it hard copy. You can get it immediately uh, on, on Kindle, and just crack the book. It's fascinating talking points, uh, and it is something that there's still a lot of smart people out there. And if we are aware of these issues and we can discuss them, then we can avoid what comes when society's intelligence dips below that which is necessary to sustain an advanced civilization. It really is almost like the lowering of IQ is like a virus that attacks the brain that will undo our civilization. It is an extraordinarily high impact event, the highest impact really that can be imagined. We have a civilization across the world where billions and billions of people are sustained by the effects of high intelligence. We lose that high intelligence, it could be the single biggest drawn out catastrophe, extinction event to some degree for billions of people. It is an extraordinarily important topic. I hope I'm not overselling it, but that's certainly the way that I see it. And so please, please get a hold of this book, tweet about it, uh, uh, put it on Facebook, write reviews about it, share the information with people around. Uh, I, I don't believe there's uh, nothing in the future but what we want to will. But if we don't have the information, we are really sailing blind off a cliff. I agree. Um, I'd also like to just briefly mention um, that a number of my colleagues and I, who, as I mentioned earlier, are sort of drawing independent funding from various individuals, are exploring sort of alternative methods of crowdfunding our research. 
um, through these these platforms like uh, Patreon that's increasingly becoming hostile to sort of controversial research and for or controversial individuals and things like Subscribestar as well, which seems to be a sort of derivative of Patreon that, that, that is more tolerant of viewpoint diversity, I guess. Um, so I've set up a, 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 an account on both of these platforms. Um, and if anyone is is interested in, in helping subsidize my, my research, uh, if they would consider donating, that would be extraordinarily generous of you and it would be jolly decent of you and it would be massively appreciated. Um, I'd also like to say we I'm, I now have a periodic appearance on YouTube on a channel called The Jolly Heretic, which I co-run with my co-author, Ed Dutton, co-authored the book, uh, with whom I co-authored the book, rather. And I put out a show the end of every week called them under the Technical Heretic label. And it's a sort of technical deep dive into various of my uh, topics, uh, various papers that I publish, various topics that are of interest. So I put out a couple of those and I'll be putting out, I'll be uploading one after this, actually. So this week's episode will, will appear um, after, I, after this recording has finished. Wonderful. Well, we'll put the links to all of that in the show notes. I really, really appreciate your time. I hope we can do it again soon. And uh, I wish you the very, very best for the rest of the day. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for hosting me.